Welcome to the first episode of Diffused Congruence, the American Muslim Experience. This is a brand new podcast, and I am your host, Zaki Hassan, and I'm joined by my partner in this endeavor, Pervez Ahmed. Thank you, Zaki. Good to be here. I'd like to also take this opportunity to welcome the listening audience. Hope you enjoy not only this show and continue to stay with us for uh, future shows. So we've been planning to do this show for a while now. We've been working on it. Uh, been a labor of love and a work in progress. Yeah. And, and it'll continue to be that. <laughs> That's right. Well, explain the title of our show, Diffused Congruence. What does that mean? Yeah, it's a mouthful, certainly. Um, so that, that's actually something that sort of comes from and stems from uh, Muslim intellectual tradition. Uh, but what I use it here in this context, I think, is to demonstrate the fact that when we talk about the American Muslim experience, we are talking about a plurality and a multiplicity of views, opinions, points of view. So the idea here is to showcase and to highlight those multi- that multiplicity of views and voices that we have from within the Muslim community and to talk about and to share uh, their views on the Muslim experience in America. Well, and, and I think that there's no better way to start our show than the person we've asked to be our guest for this very first episode. Uh, somebody who uh, I think from the moment we thought of doing the show, I know from my end I was like, this is who I want to be on, and so we're very honored to have him with us. Uh, Usama Cannon joins us, and he is the founding director of Tatleaf Collective, which is based in the San Francisco Bay Area. They also have uh, facilities in Chicago. Uh, my hometown, and uh, I think for a lot of people, uh, Osama Cannon is the voice of uh, the many modern American Muslims, and he he speaks to their concerns in a way that they can recognize and understand. And I want to welcome him right now. Thank you for joining us. Thank you for having me. Part of the reason for doing the show is, is very selfish on my part because I like the idea of being able to sit and have a conversation with an interesting person, and I think you have a fascinating story that's worth sharing with uh, not just the Muslim community but uh, the broader community out there. And uh, I was wondering if you could walk us through your journey. Uh, what brought you to the point now where we are now sitting in the, the wonderful facilities here at Tatleaf Collective? Uh, how, how did you get here? Where, 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 do, where do you consider the beginning of your journey? Well, there's a short version, um, a medium version, and a long version to that to that um, question, if one were to attempt to respond. Um, you know, the, the long version would begin where... Um, a group of African people were enslaved um, and brought across the Atlantic Ocean and then were obviously um, slaves in this land for what ends up being several hundred years. Um, and at some point, a group of those slaves, who I do not know by name, um, intermarry with some of the native peoples of this land from the Cherokee and the Blackfoot nations, um, and then my father's ancestors are eventually born, Hmm. somewhere in between Texas and Oklahoma. And sometime along that same experience, uh, a group of European immigrants came from a combination of um, the UK, what is now the UK, between, you know, uh, Britain and uh, Ireland, and probably Italy, Um, and at some point my mother's ancestors get together, and then... And um, then sometime around 1942, my father's ancestors migrate from uh, Oklahoma to San Jose. And uh, I, that's where I typically begin my story, because I just happen to know those demarcations on my father's side the years a little bit better than my father's. He came here when he was a baby in the year he was born in 1942. And one of the interesting kind of Markers is that when he came to San Jose, there were two black churches in San Jose at the time. Antioch Baptist Church, which ends up being the, the church that my family goes to for the next several decades. Um, they arrived on Friday, by Sunday they were at, at church at Antioch Baptist Church. It was interestingly just a couple blocks down from SBIA in uh, downtown San Jose. Wow. Um, my, my mother... Um, By the time she gets to high school, to make a long story short, she's driving and she sees this young African-American lady whose car broke down. She's with her friend. 
they give her a ride home, and that's my cousin Sharon who ends up introducing my parents. Yeah. Hmm. So basically, you know, to go from slavery to European immigration to Native American and Black inter- intermarriage right. to my cousin's car breaking down and my mom gives her ride home, and that's how my parents end up meeting. Wow! Hmm. So <laughs> you can imagine, you know, there's a that's lot. Right. I think that the reason that's really significant for me is I. Um, when you talk about being an American, at least from the, the kind of historical perspective, the, the black, the Native American, and the white experience are all very much alive within me and my heritage. Right. Um, my mother, um, my grandmother narrated to me, and I believe it to be true because I never know, knew her to tell a lie, that she was a descendant of the American president, Andrew Jackson, which is ironic if you think about his relationship with the Cherokee. That's right. His relationship with the other um, tribes in the southeast. So that's really where my story begins. Um, it begins with the beginning of America, quite literally. Um, and yeah, but grew up, I was born in 77, grew up um, in San Jose, Campbell to be specific, suburb of San Jose. Um, yeah, and very much, you know, I think the, the idea of being in a, in a multiracial family very much informs my identity, both uh, in terms of just personal experience, but also ultimately what leads me to kind of look into Islam and, and what have you. And and where do, where does that part of the story start? So that that's kind of a 1990s experience. Fast forwarding a little bit, my older brother gets turned on to the Nation of Islam through hip hop, specifically through pu- Public Enemy, mm-hmm. led by the famous Chuck D. Mm-hmm. Um, you know. Um, at that point, I'm beginning high school. Um, the 90s, as you know, were kind of a period where there was this, at least a brief resurgence of kind of black pride and expressions of authentic black rage and right. attempt, attempts to kind of revisit black identity and what have you. And you have the Do the Right Thing by Spike Lee, and you have you know hip hop music being strongly informed by themes of, of black consciousness. That's right, public enemy at the forefront. Right. Yeah. And so my brother gets turned on to the Nation of Islam eventually joins the Nation of Islam uh, very formally and is a very active member in the Nation of Islam, which at that time had a smaller community in San Jose in the South Bay. Wow. Um, teaches me about the, the the teachings of Elijah Muhammad and the Nation of Islam. And at first I thought he was mad just because it was so starkly different from what I had been exposed to as a nominal Christian. <laughs> um, but really what kind of sparked my interest was that, that social historical piece of, of kind of looking at identity and just... And so that led me to ultimately identify as a member of the Nation of Islam, hmm. which, um, for those who know about you know the nation's teachings, there's a very serious critique of white power and the white power right. establishment and whiteness and what have you, and white supremacy and right. these things, to the extent that they would call the white man the devil, which is having a white mom, you can imagine, is a pretty... Well, <laughs> I was going to say, I mean, coming from like a biracial, like a biracial background uh, and then sort of autom- like identifying with this very... Sort of prototypical black consciousness, black nationalist movement. And that must have been a very interesting. Yeah, I mean, for some very interesting dinner conversations. For sure. The I mean, you know, the, the, the interesting thing is that like you have the one drop theory um, that mm-hmm. if a person has so much as a drop of African blood, they're an African, and uh, that would have had very real implications for slaves during yeah. during um, the period of slavery. For us, you know, you're in, I'm in the South Bay in the suburbs. I didn't grow up in the hood That's right. by any stretch of the imagination. Right. Um, grew up in Campbell, Las Gadas kind of area. Um, but what it was was just agitating the question of identity mm-hmm. and, and kind of how does one reconcile being black and being white and, and the Native American piece kind of conveniently being shoved in there somewhere and oftentimes overlooked, mm-hmm. um, you know, unfortunately. People not maybe being it for, for a number of reasons. Yeah, but the really ironic part was that my mother was always very supportive of our of our engagement with the nation of Islam. My father, on the other hand, oh, he, he totally, uh, he, he, God bless him. You know, he, he, uh, he took issue with it, to say the least. Um, my mother was supportive and that, those are one of the things like, okay, the white man's the devil. Like my mom's not the devil. (laughs) (laughs) She's far from it. Right. Just, just to, uh, piggyback off something you just said, you you described yourself as a nominal Christian. Mm Mm-hmm. I was wondering if you could go into that a little bit more about what what your headspace was in religious terms before being exposed to to the nation. Yeah, well, you know, I think my father again comes from a very devout Christian family. Uh, they would go to church services as children twice a week as a minimum. 
Um, my mother was without exaggeration. My grandmother was without an exaggeration. His mother was it mm. without exaggeration a matriarch in the church. Mm. You know, Mama Cannon. You had you know this is a kind of the traditional, you know, Mama Cannon or Mama Jackson or Mama So and So. Um, but my father, by the time I was born, wasn't practicing. He wasn't very devout. I mean, he may have prayed and what have you, but he wasn't um, a very committed Christian. My mother, interestingly, um, had become a Mormon as a young lady. And eventually, um, she eventually departs from that. But there wasn't a kind of household religion. And so even the idea of a belief in God or any religious identity for me was began really as a personal personal journey. And the church, a number of different denominations of the church was my first and only real reference point. So I thought I was Christian, but there were certain things um, having to do with Christology or having to do with you know believing in Christ as divine that never really sat well with me. And I say that with all due respect to to my Christian friends and family members. Um, but there were just things that, that, didn't, that didn't sit well with me. So that's what I mean by being nominally Christian. I believed in the divine. I believed in the Most High. Um, but I just didn't... The, the Praying to a person or worshiping a person is never really... Which you can imagine is exacerbated with the theology of the nation of Islam, which that's basically right. claims that Fard Muhammad was God, God in person. That's right. Elijah Muhammad is a messenger of God. And again, with all due respect to my friends and family who identify as members of the nation of Islam, theologically that never really stuck. It mm-hmm. was the social conversation that the nation was having. It mm-hmm. was the critique of the power structure that the nation was having. It was that you know authentic understanding of black masculinity and femininity that the nation was having that really you know stuck with me. But the so that leads me to ultimately look into to Orthodox Islam. So you're this is this is the early nineties. Mm. This is yeah, so this whole conversation, yeah, yeah. The first half of the nineties basically. You're in high school. So you're in you're in high school. school. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And you know, you're, you're talking about the power structure and uh, no, notions of, of race and, and, and dominance, and whatnot. Did you did you find that you that you were alienated from from your classmates and whatnot? Because that seems like a very different headspace to be in, given what most people are thinking about at that age. You know, I'll tell you a story that I think probably most accurately answers that question. Um, I think my sophomore year of high school, which would have been ninety two. Um, they the school failed to announce Cinco de Mayo, the famous Mexican holiday, and um, we basically occupied Westmont High. I mean, we, we literally walk out of fifth period, and people who went to school with me can they can attest to this. It was a true story, you know. They because it's Cinco de Mayo, you don't just not recognize it and say we had a large Latino population, Mexican particular at our school, right. Westmont High and Campbell San Jose, and we literally occupied the cafeteria. We marched out of fifth period and we're like, Y'all did it make a single mile. <laughs> so basically all of the disgruntled colored folk in our school kind of, you know, they kinda of get together and we marched on on, mm-hmm. on the school. And the dean came and the principal came and they're you know, they're trying to like right, kind of appease yeah. That's right. <laughs> This angry colored force at the high school that's you know speaking <laughs> truth to power because but that's that's what kind of informed the collective consciousness of people in the nineties oh. largely to do with what was in the music. That's right because I was going to say like I mean, like referencing the mid nineties or the early nineties. Uh, I'm thinking also about um, when states were celebrating um, Martin Luther King mm-hmm. MLK Day, right? Remember Arizona and mm-hmm. then Public Enemy song. Mm-hmm. So that, that was very much in the context. Yeah, and, and the thing is, again, uh, we were products. Black History Month wasn't celebrated until the, until the early '90s. I mean, we were products of. Yeah. You're talking not long after Mandela's release from exactly. prison. Exactly. You know, I mean, I exactly. saw Nelson Prisoner Mandela. High school. Yeah. I saw Nelson Mandela at the Oakland Coliseum the oh. year after he was the year he was released. He came and spoke there, and the Coliseum was full of people. Oh. My sister Dawn took to the Martin Luther King Day Parade mm-hmm. every year. Juneteenth, the festivals for Juneteenth, which is a holiday celebrated particularly for blacks from Oklahoma and Texas, because Juneteenth, when the Emancipation, Pro- Emancipation, Emancipation Proclamation was kind of um, drops, it doesn't hit Texas and other That's western right. states till months later. Yeah. So black folks from Texas will celebrate Emancipation on Juneteenth, which is a, a kind of later holiday than the actual date that the proclamation was initially uh-huh. released. These, this was my experience growing up. And, you know, so, but the, back to the story, right? So we <laughs> occupied the cafeteria, and then they had a club they initiated at um, Westmont High called Unity Through Diversity. And there was a staff 
uh, counselor, I don't remember his name, God bless him, really, and he ironically was this older white man with this big, long white beard, he kind of looked like Santa Claus. He was our staff advisor. And again, it was a space for the blacks, the Latinos, the mestizos, the mixed people, people of color who identify as people of color to have a space to talk about what that meant vis-a-vis you know, a, uh, vis-a-vis a majority, vis-a-vis a power structure. Um, so those that was my high school experience, man. Mm-hmm. And that the music we listened to and the things we celebrated were very much they were they were socially resistant, you mm-hmm. know, against yeah, the kind of right. the, 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 the kind of raging against, Rage against the machine. The machine so speak, yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And did did you ever feel? Uh, sort of torn between cultures in the sense that you you were choosing to identify with um against i should say the 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 those exercising privilege but you you're kind of occupying a nexus where by virtue of not being purely this or purely that you were kind of in the middle for sure and i think part of that comes from the fact that i'm as light as i am yeah and growing up you know i would hear uh people drop the n-word and not knowing that my father was black you know, I saw a side of, of, of you know the underbelly, so to speak, of, of white privilege right. as a person, an African American who could pass uh, by white standards. So I saw, I saw that. So I think that probably most immediately informs my choice to identify with my black side more than my white side. I mean, I'm mm-hmm. even thinking, I, not not even knowing the dates, but when your parents must have married. There were states in the country where their union would not be recognized. Had I been born ten years earlier, uh-huh. I, I'm born. Give me my birthday here, but I'm born seventy-seven. Right? Well, I'm born nine years to the day of Dr. King's assassination. After okay. Dr. King's assassination, so wow. figure. I mean, figure right. Yeah. Nine years to the day after Dr. King's assassination. Right, seventy-eight. Had my parents been married um, mm. um, ten years earlier, my their marriage and my birth would have been illegal in sixteen of the fifty United States. Wow. And this is the thing I think so many young people are forgetting. They that do. When my father was 18, he couldn't vote because he was an African-American. Exactly. By the time he retires or he's in his kind of, you know, he's, by the time he had retired, he sees, he sees a black American in the White House. So a lot has changed in our generation, a lot more than we realize, you know. I, I think what, what, what you're saying, what's so interesting to me is at a very young age, you made a decision to identify with your black side. And that at least culturally, that amounts to a rejection of the privilege that comes with whiteness. It's convenient to do that when you live in a big, beautiful home in the suburbs. <laughs> okay. Right. right. I mean, to be, you know, to be yeah. honest, real, is it like, yeah. well, we hashtag first world problems, right? right. <laughs> and so, I mean, there, there is a piece of it that's like, it's convenient kind of suburban protest that is maybe not as authentic as, it's definitely not as authentic as what, um, my ancestors had to go through. Right. And my grandfather told stories to my father and to my aunties of people. You know, they were in good with the white folks and, in Oklahoma. You're talking about maybe parts through, of, yeah. through Oklahoma yeah. and even in California. Texas, California okay. Yeah, he leaves Tyler, Texas, very young. Okay. He leaves Tyler, Texas, probably sometime in the twenties. This is like the Dust Bowl. We're talking like the like the like uh, the Jodes and and, and yeah. Grapes of Wrath, right? I mean, <laughs> yeah. the migration to California. Yeah. I don't so, know if they were a fruit laborer, but you know, yeah, come well, yeah. He was fruit. a mechanic, and okay. he eventually worked for for the garbage company, Green Valley Disposal. Right. Um, really interesting narrative. Yeah, you know, really when is. I when I sit with my father and my mother and other people, I ask them to just tell us the oral history because that's the thing. A lot of young people they just don't even ask their parents. Exactly. Like what. What right. was it like for you? Um, Let alone their grandparents. Yeah. So my grandfather would tell stories of how, because he was in good with the white folks, they would call him and say, hey, Emery, look what we caught ourselves, and open a bag, and they would have a black man's hand cut off that they mm. took from a lynching. Wow. Um, and to just what would it, what must it have been like, and that he would have to hold face, and then he couldn't break before. Yeah. My great-grandfather was lynched by the Klan in front of his daughter. I had uncles, and not direct uncles, but great uncles and other mm. family members who were lynched, and we know about that stuff. So... Yeah, I mean, I think part of it is the fact that I'm a man and my father is black, and so identifying just in terms of, you know, male identity and, and identifying with the fact that the most of the influential men in my life early on were were African American males. I mean, my, my brother-in-law Milton is the person who taught me how to play basketball. Every time I go on a basketball court, I can't help but think about Milton. Um, right. So it's not like a choice to identify as much as part of just the nature of being what one may call mulatto or being biracial is that I've never disavowed myself from my white heritage and I don't hate it by any stretch of the matter. I may still have a critique of you know uh, the power structure I may still have something to say about the stuff of white privilege 
um, especially someone of African American heritage who appears to me to be someone who is is white, right. because you know I've never met in my in my whole life probably two black people that didn't know I was black mm. or even asked me what are you, but white folk ask me all the time you know where are you and so I don't know how much of it was a choice or how much of it is just the reality of being biracial an interesting piece. For so many people today, especially people in communities like the Muslim community that is as diverse as it is, will get ready for the future. That's right. People, hmm. um, you know, yeah. the idea that people are going to continue to only marry within the pools of folks from the countries that they or their parents have immigrated from, that's not the American narrative. And that's we're right. not going to be around to force that. And eventually, our community is going to look very different 20 years from now, 10 years from now, let alone 20 or 50 years from now. Um, so yeah, I mean, and it's good for it's good for the it's good for the species. It strengthens strengthens you know strengthens people's genetic kind of <laughs> a lot. Yeah. So so th- this is your now you are a part of the nation, and at what point do you start having second and and what what's your exposure then to to quote unquote mainstream Islam as as you move away from that? Sure. Um, so I go through high school. My brother is an active member of the nation, so my father, because of his objection to my membership, I was never kind of like as formally. Um, I couldn't. I couldn't. Um, I couldn't kind of sign up the, to the same extent that my brother did. But I would go to meetings a lot of times in secrecy because of my father's objection. Um, to be honest, is to create kind of a, a vulnerable space. My parents were actually separated at one point. Okay because of my mother's support of my brother taking me to the nation meetings. Um, that's how tense that was for my family. Um, you know, that my, my father, again, was really against it. My mother was supportive, uh, and my brother gets kicked out of the house, and my mother kind of was, like, rolled with him. So literally, our involvement in the nation at one point created enough strife that my parents were temporarily separated. They eventually divorced, but this was earlier on where they were still married. They were temporarily separated, largely to do with that that event. Um, so needless to say, it was agitated. I mean, it was, huh. you know, and again, the white ladies coming out in support and the brothers objecting to it, so all of these. Why was she supportive? My mom's a special lady, and I know everyone thinks that about their mom. Um, but she is a, a very, very... And my father's a special man as well. Um, my mother, you know... Um, yeah, man, she's my best friend. And she is um, one of the most down-to-earth, loving, sincere people I've ever met. And I think a lot of, a lot of it just had to do with her unconditional love. You know, she's just... My mom's not a judgmental person. Mm -hmm. And I think it kind of goes back to your question earlier about being nominally Christian, is that I think, to be honest, one of the reasons I'm able to even identify as a religious person is that I never had religion shoved down my throat. Mm -hmm. You know, no one was telling... I don't remember getting told about heaven or hell, or you're going to go to hell, or God's going to be mad at you when I was a child. I don't remember that. That wasn't my experience. And so I think that like it, some of the negative feelings that people have about religion, and unfortunately sometimes about God, has to do with the way that religion is presented to them as children. That's right. Yeah, if we're being honest. Yeah. Um, so back to mom, why was she supportive? Just because she's down like that. I mean, she's just not mom just roll. She's just <laughs> she's just you know, mom's the homie. That's what we would say. She's the homie. That's what that's what my sister and my brother. That's the homie. You know, mom's. Pops is, you know, he's, he pops is an authoritative figure in our life. Um, and I, I'm, I'm thankful to God for that now. As a kid, I hated it. But now, you know, looking back, you know. Yeah. So long story short, my brother's in the nation. I'm kind of following along. The situation's pretty rough for a while. Um, then my brother meets a beautiful man named Bilal, known as Imam Bilal in the South Bay community, um, who had a TV TV show, I know you're Battle in the Sky. Yeah. You know, a lot of people don't realize the centrality of Imam Bilal in the narrative of the Yahya Rodas's, Mustafa Davis's, Anas Cannon's, Osama Cannon's of the world. They don't realize it. Had it not been for him, mm-hmm. none of the story would have wow. happened. Wow, that's amazing. Because Imam Bilal would regularly attend the nation meetings with Minister Khalil, Minister Joe, with the nation, okay. as an Orthodox Muslim meets Anas, tells him about Orthodox Islam, begins to introduce him to Orthodox Islam, and before you know it, Anas is now a Sunni Muslim. 
um, largely, almost entirely, to do with Imam Bilal, and then eventually meeting the likes of Imam Fahim Shu'aib, mm-hmm. um, Allah preserve him, you know, and other kind of central figures in, in the Bay Area community. Um, so he becomes a Sunni Muslim. By this point, I'm like junior summer, getting ready to go into senior year. And the moment, you know, we all have those kind of, those, those kind of, those kind of uh, big moments in your life. Yeah. One of the biggest was my brother, we're sitting in the back room of our house to grow up in, and he says to me, told me he was leaving the nation, and he told me why he was leaving the nation. And then he said to me, just remember that your relationship with God is an individual relationship between you and him. Mm. That's one thing he said. He said, and the second thing is that everybody has a dual or an other except Allah. <laughs> Only Allah is one. Ultimately, absolutely one. And I was like, finally, like, could you guys have told me this? <laughs> I mean, it sounds like a no-brainer to a lot of people, but it's like you're kind of traversing all of these different kind of really... And it was like, whoa. Like, yeah. okay, that's what I've been looking for. And I literally feel like the room, you know, was spinning after that because it was like, la ilaha illallah. Like, that's for right. the first time I hear this idea of, like, the absolute unity of God. Mm-hmm. Granted, I'm like a junior in high school still, right? So it's like right. senior year becomes this really interesting exploration of intersection between Judaism and Christianity and or Islam and Rastafarianism. I had dreadlocks by that point. It was kind of a really devout, you know, Rasta Muslim kind of strange perennial like mix of who knows what. <laughs> but I'm thankful for that period, man, because if it wasn't for that and what I experienced and, and the meditation and the realizations and the openings that I found in that period, I never would have become Muslim. Yeah. You know? And keep in mind Yahya Rodas and I we go to school together since like sixth grade, who Yahya is also a you know, fairly known Muslim scholar. Of course. Um, we graduate freshman year. He goes to UC San Diego. I go to De Anza, which is a local junior college. Yeah. Um, I teach there. Yeah. De Anza is really central in my whole thing. Actually, the whole, this whole story kind of happens at De Anza College. No, yeah. Don't want to get you in trouble at work. But, <laughs> <laughs> but um, he goes to UC San Diego. I go to De Anza. Freshman year at Dianza, I start meeting all of these kind of real hip Muslims who like poetry circles and poetry readings, all this stuff. And again, it's still this 1990s. Yeah. This is 96, 95, 96. No, this is 95. Okay. So it's still smack dab in the middle of this whole kind of period. And, um, and now this begins to highlight for me, like, this idea that, like, I want to become Muslim. By this point, my brother's a devout Sunni Muslim, and he's... He offers a pretty heavy critique of some of my behavior and some of my tendencies and is encouraging me to kind of get more serious. And I identified as a Muslim, mm-hmm. you know, I, but I didn't like publicly identify as a Muslim. I hadn't formally embraced Islam. Mm-hmm. Um, so sophomore year at De Anza, which is now 1996, Yahya Rodas tells his parents he wants to leave UC San Diego. And he's, I think it was made the varsity basketball team. He's doing his undergrad in economics and tells his tells his parents he wants to leave East San Diego to come back to De Anza, right? So he's basically backtracking, and it largely had to do with the fact that we're both very much interested in Islam. Mm. And he's kind of wants to come back to this community. He comes back to De Anza, um, and, and freshman year, so before this happens, I meet this guy, Brian Davis, who is another mixed-race mulatto guy. That's right. Um, he knows Muslims that I grew up with. We kind of hang out. We're at sushi one day, and he says to me, look, I'm interested in becoming Muslim. And he said, I'm interested in revisiting religion. This is over a conversation at lunch. And I said, you should become Muslim. He says, are you Muslim? I said, no, but my brother is. He says, well, what do they believe? I told him the basic tenets of the Muslim faith. And then he goes to Barnes & Nobles with the intention of buying a Bible, walks into the religion section, passes by Eastern philosophy, picks up the book Muhammad by Martin Ling's off mm. the shelf. <laughs> begins reading it, and he said, I was kind of just kind of dismayed by it, or just kind of confused by it. all of the son of so-and-so, father of so-and-so. He couldn't, the genealogy of the prophets That's in the right. front of the book, so he's like, what? He puts it back on the shelf, and then he sees the Quran, picks it up and opens up this chapter on Mary, Surat Medium, which hmm. for anybody who at any point identified as a Christian or comes from a Christian background, That's right. it's, it's, it's like, wow. Yeah. So he's weeping by the time he leaves the bookstore, buys the Quran. By Friday, he's Muslim. That was Wednesday. Wow. So he comes back to De Anza and he's the Assalamu alaikum, my brother guy, right? With the cool <laughs> guy. He's, he's that guy on campus, right? Remember 90s, yeah, right? Yeah, he's yeah, the, he's right. that guy on that's campus. Right. 
<laughs> and uh, we used to write music together in the piano room at De Anza. There's like this piano room, you have to have a code to get in, and I, we had snuck the code from who knows where, and we're going to the piano room and playing, making music in the piano room. We really bond. That's Mustafa Davis. Mm-hmm. Um, so he, we're hanging out that whole year. Next year, Yahya's come back now to De Anza. We all know all the different Muslims. He's been Muslim now for, you know, just under a year, I think. Calls me on Thursday, September 5th, 1996, and says, Hey, do you want to go to Juma tomorrow, the Friday prayer with me? I said, Sure. And I knew you had to take a bath, and I knew you had to, you know, wear good clothes and what have you. So I get dressed up, I'm going to MCA. And I think somewhere in the back of my mind, I may have had this hunch that I was going to say my Shahada, which is to formally embrace Islam. But I, I wasn't sure. I walk in MCA, which is one of the larger local it's, mosques it's here. It's like one of these mega mosques. It's kind of a mega Bay, mosque. Yeah. It was at a different phase of its growth, but it was right. still a large congregation. Right. I walk in, and I just look at all these Muslims. I'm like, man, where are you guys hiding? Because there's Muslims everywhere, right? And Irfan Sadat was given the khutbah that day. Um, we go to Juma, pray, and then after Juma, Irfan, by, who's the imam, says, there's a brother who wants to say his shahada. And Mustafa nudges me, goes, hey, that's you, bro. <laughs> right? So he kind of, like, it was September 6th, so I went and said my shahada that day. Um, not under any coercion, but under some pretty strong <laughs> some <laughs> nudging. <laughs> <laughs> some nudging. But I, already, I already knew. Like when he said the shahada to me, I already knew it. He's like, repeat after me, and I already knew it. Then he goes, Tech beer. I was like, Hello, Akbar. Like I already knew. Because I'd been around my brother's Muslim, I'd been exposed to it. So yeah, I mean, that was the beginning of uh, of my journey as a Muslim. So, so this is now, we're into 90. Seven. This is September ninety six. Se- September ninety six. Okay. Yeah. So now, now you said you were before you took the shahada, you were identifying as Muslim. Mm-hmm. But I find it interesting that when when uh, Brian slash Mustafa asked you if you're Muslim, you said no, I'm not. But my- well, because you know the 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 thing is that like for people who are familiar with the the historical legacy of the Nation of Islam and the, the centrality of that, the contribution of the Nation of Islam, particularly in inner-city communities and in African-American communities, the Nation of Islam identifies Muslim um, by the standards of Islamic orthodoxy and the standards of Islamic orthopraxy, they would not be considered Muslim. And I say that again as someone who loves that community and, 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 and cherishes the, you know, the legacy but also by the standards of Islamic orthodoxy, right. orthodox Muslims do not consider them Muslim. Mm-hmm. And folk from the nation know that, and people from orthodox Muslim communities know that. So it's not like I'm unveiling some secret. I mean, <laughs> right, if people, right. people know that, I think that has to do with part of it. Is that, And if you look at people who come um, from the nation of Islam to orthodox Islam under the leadership of the late Imam Orthodox Muhammad, uh, God have mercy on him, there is the idea of the first resurrection and then the second resurrection. The, right. the first resurrection is when Elijah Muhammad, under the instruction of Farad Muhammad, comes and offers this unique message to black people, and that's the first time black Americans are resurrected, so to speak. Right. And the second resurrection is when Imam Muhammad, you can barely think of it without weeping, um, when he brings you know, well over, you know, probably close to half a million, if not a million people, eventually from the understanding of the nation of Islam to al-Islam. Mm-hmm. And that's the second resurrection. And that, I mean, undoubtedly, the largest communal conversion to Islam in Western Muslim history. I mean, arguably one of the larger ones probably ever in the history of Islam. Right. But he literally leads a mass conversion to Orthodox Islam. And it's one of the great pieces of American Muslim history that is really, really understudied, underappreciated. Um, and is basically a narrative that is passing with the passing of those pioneers. It is. It is. Um, and it's a very, very important part of the American Muslim story that people who aren't familiar with that experience, you know, a lot of people you find in, in, in so-called, so-called immigrant Muslim communities that even don't even know that Imam Muhammad was an Orthodox Muslim and an Orthodox Imam who leads an Orthodox Muslim community. Yeah. And there are people who will just kind of, are they nation? They don't really know. And that's part of that kind of historical experience. So having been in my own micro version of that transition from the nation to Islam, I think that's when I probably would have said no, i.e. I understood that the Shahada was, you know, an articulation of belief in the tenets of Orthodox Islam. Mm. And I also, you know, my brother told me something probably some months before that. He said, look, man, when you say you're Shahada, you're forgiven of any wrong you've done in the past. 
but you're also accountable for whatever you do. So I was like, oh snap, I better kind of, you know, get get rid of, <laughs> get some of the stuff, <laughs> just kind of do some dirt, you know. So <laughs> <laughs> that was the kind of yeah, yeah. very faulty. Get it out of your system, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. Man. It's like I'm a kid, man. That's I'm 19 right. years old. Yeah, yeah. It's like you know, whatever. And I think that's probably what it was. Mm. And, and just for context, the age difference between you and your brother three and a half years. Three and a half years. So, so uh, how, how were you? Were you very close? Was what, did you look up to him more? As look up is a gross understatement. I mean, there's been no one in my life more um, important in general especially in terms of informing my understanding of masculinity, uh, in terms of holding my hand through conversations about understanding the Most High and one's relationship with the Most High, uh, in terms of informing my fashion sense, in terms of um, teaching me how to defend myself. I mean, Yahya and I basically ride on his coattails socially mm. forever, up until the point we become Muslim, and there's some level of, you know, at least perceived kind of whatever um, prominence in the Muslim community, and I haven't I haven't forgotten that that's all standing on Anas's shoulders. I think he's had his own very interesting explorations, and even you know as of late, kind of maybe not even identifying publicly as a Muslim anymore, mm-hmm. which is part of the story. But yeah, that doesn't is. that doesn't discredit the fact that I mean close. Close like the way an older brother who kind of is raising his younger brother are close. Mm-hmm. I mean, yeah, he picks on me, he beats me up, but he also is a person who... I mean, literally the dean of our high school let me slide on stuff because Anas was my older brother. Wow. <laughs> literally. Wow. Like, and people didn't mess with us when we grew up. I mean, yeah, we grew up in Campbell. We didn't grow up in the hood, but there were people fought. You know, that kind of... That jock versus yeah. rocker versus stoner versus kind of gangster culture of kind of oh, yeah. high schools. Yeah. We no one messed with us. Mm. You best believe it. They weren't. They wouldn't in their wildest imagination even think about putting hands on John Rodas or Whitney Cannon. <laughs> That's the last thing you're going to do because you have to answer to a, a, you know <laughs> you have to answer to some people you don't want to answer to. Right. So close is an understatement. Yeah. And honestly, these are the kind of conversations people don't really hear me have. You know, because there's this whole... It's always got to be a chutbah, right? No, no, I, I, which is... This is what we <laughs> That's kind of what the show is about. That's right, that's yeah. right. So, and, yeah. and I think that so much of this is lost, I mean, just in terms of just... The, it's like an oral history. You know, yeah. You're recording these stories and, and yeah. preserving yeah. them, so... Uh, and so, so now, so now we're into we're into ninety six. At what point do you intersect with Zaytuna? Because obviously, well, that's, I mean, that's why you know, it's I, I, when I tell the story, I'm like, what's well, actually pretty, pretty amazing the way that the planets align. Zaytuna yeah. Institute is founded in nineteen ninety six. Hmm. Yeah, Yahya Rodas and I, you know, it, the the way that I kind of end up intersecting with Zaytuna is that I become Muslim Friday, September sixth, nineteen ninety six. Tuesday or Wednesday of that following week, a man named Sheikh Khatri Walbeba, who's a Mauritanian scholar, comes to the Bay Area under the auspices of Sheikh Hamza Yusuf and ends up at MCA within a day or two of him coming to the country, leaving Mauritania literally for the first time ever in his life. At this point, he's well into his 60s, if I'm not mistaken, mm-hmm. maybe pushing 70, I don't know, but he was, I believe, well into his 60s. One of the most regal, um, you know, um, noble people that I'd ever seen at that point. Just this, you know, looked like he looked like something of a time past. He right. looked like someone who came from a different, literally a different era. This big, beautiful white beard, this big, beautiful white turban, this big, flowing, beautiful white robe, and just a face that just spoke of all of these. <laughs> You know, I mean, amazing poet, an amazing scholar. And so I meet him the day Yahya comes to MCA to say his shahada, which is exactly a week after me. So imagine, even with some seven years, and you're meeting like this great sheikh, and, you know, yeah. the likes of whom are, frankly, an anomaly even in the Muslim majority world today. Correct. Um, he walks up and gives Yahya his shahada, and Tarif Arabi translates, who was a close friend of Sheikh Hamza Yusuf. Um, by the time Sheikh Khatri finishes Yahya Shahada, he's weeping. He's never seen someone convert to Islam before. Hmm. Um, so Yahya kind of became his surrogate son because it's like, wow. and he said to him, he said, I love you more than my own kids. The fact that I saw you embrace Islam today. So here you got this white kid from Las Gatas and this great Mauritanian Sheikh who developed this like bond. And I got to kind of joyride through that experience because Yahya is my best friend. Right. Right. We go to Uncle Tarif's house after Juma. They feed us fruit. And, you know, who feeds, who cuts apples for you? 
and hands you who peels oranges for you and feeds you fruit with their hand and sit I mean like I've never seen anything like these people. Like who who are these guys, right? Like no seriously, like, cutting the apple and peeling it for you, handing it to you. The amount of love and the amount of generosity and the amount of kindness. And then, you know, Sheikh Khatri tells Yahya, um, you gotta go bathe. And so he says, and make sure you rub your whole body, which is the dominant opinion in the Maliki school of law, that when you perform the, pure, the purificatory bath, that you actually rub, rub everywhere. That's right, rubbing. So Yahya goes upstairs, comes back like half hour later, beat red, kind of comes down. Rubbing <laughs> so we're learning like, you know, we're learning like, you know, kind of, Sarah, yeah. we're learning like very proper Maliki jurisprudence, Correct. which is a form of Islamic law, mm-hmm. out the gate. Sheikh Hamza at that point, I think, was abroad in Mauritania, eventually comes back, and then we met him, ironically, not through Sheikh Khatri and Uncle Tarif, but through a man who, again, you know, it's hard to not weep thinking about um, Uncle Muhammad Abdubari, who's an Irish-American convert, who was a longtime friend of Sheikh Hamza. He just invites us into his house, and he's like, come over and eat. And so we go to his house, and we're eating, and hang out. He took us under his wing. My first uh, iftar ever. My first time I ever broke fast after fasting Ramadan I was at his home. And he eventually introduces us to Sheikh Hamza. And they, have, they had been friends for a long time. And so yeah, it's within the first year of embracing Islam that yeah. we were blessed and very honored um, and I think very uniquely afforded the opportunity to benefit from the, the great scholarship of, of Sheikh Hamza Yusuf and his contribution. Um, you know, God bless him. Because I'm just trying to see, like, in terms of, you know, my own trajectory and, and, and where the where, where the alignments are. Because I'm thinking September 5th, 1996, that's, you know, Labor Day, 1996, the big ISNA annual convention. Wow. Uh, Sheikh Hamza is a prominent speaker. I know for sure 1996 he was there. I think that might have been the year it was either in Columbus or it was back in Chicago. So uh, already Sheikh Hamza is on the national scene. Mm-hmm. Is that... Is that known here locally? Well, you know those tapes, right? Those cassette tapes. Yeah, Alhambra Productions. Alhambra Productions. That's the Jowl right. in the New World Order, and, and yeah, and, right. And, and, I mean, so, death and dying. And so yeah. yeah, I mean, that, actually, before I met Sheikh Hamza, I heard a tape of him. Yeah. At, I think Mustafa's house. I was like, man, that guy's smart. I was like, <laughs> it's like, I, you know, again, like, where <laughs> right. do you hear voices like that? It's like, that's right. That's right. And 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 I and he, you know. He had this voice. It was like what, I mean, what he was saying was like whoa. Like That's right. I mean, and I think again, it's easy to live in the age of someone that great and to offer your critique of what they may be doing or saying. But take a step back and think about the historical contribution of someone like Hamza Yusuf. Absolutely, a generation of people, a generation, literally a generation of people who are inspired to learn about Islam, or who are inspired to even think critically. Think critically. You know, about Islam or about anything else. Um, You know, we were the first... I have this on my desk, and I have it here every day as a reminder. You know, the first time anyone wrote the alphabet, the Arabic alphabet for me, was Sheikh Hamza, you know, in 1996. And And I have it here on... I look at it all day, every day as a reminder, like, don't forget where you came from. This is who taught you Arabic, and he said, copy this as many times as you can, Mm. and by the hands of our dictionary and so here's my copying it on the 60 bus back to my house in Campbell from his house over off Monroe in Santa Clara next to my poetry of whatever and so, you know. so this is uh, just to, for for the sake of the microphone. So, we're, what we're looking at is the Arabic alphabet written by Sheikh Hamza, written yeah. by Sheikh Hamza on a, a, a spiral notebook, yeah. right? And yeah. then me copying it. <laughs> and so, you know, I mean, yeah, I yeah. teach Arabic now, right. and I and I so. You know, he's at Isna on the mega conference, but he's still in his That's what I'm teaching saying. the conference how to do all of that. Fascinating for me. Well, mm-hmm. I mean, maybe you can contextualize that for us a little bit. What what was your perception of Sheikh Hamza and and the role that he was playing, uh, not just in your life at that moment, but for the community as a whole, because because as Pervez is saying, I mean that's really when he started to become uh, more prominent in people's awareness. Oh, right. Well, I think we knew that. I mean, by that point, I haven't been to Isna anywhere, but what I'm seeing up close and personal is him beginning to translate works and beginning to really, you know, what the stuff that ultimately becomes the the kind of core of what is now the Tuna College yeah. and this idea of literally translating Islam, contextualizing Islam bringing Islam here and giving it a proper institutional articulation, we're seeing the very beginning of that, Um, at least in terms of his translated works and the stuff that he begins to write. Um, 
And so my context is more having an up-close and personal look at someone who's obviously mastered the Arabic language beyond... And watching Arabs dumbfounded, literally. Watching people who were themselves children of scholars, literally dumbfounded by his command of the Arabic language in all of its different sciences. Um, so I'm looking at him more as like a really bona fide scholar. And simultaneously, he's my mentor. He's the person who's, who's you know... Um, <laughs> You know, yeah, I could tell you a story, too, about just really... I remember went to Sheikh Hamza. Again, this is the angry 1990s, you know, fight the police, <laughs> F the police, fight the power, you know, rage against the machine kid. And so I'm wearing camel pants at the class of Ibn Ashur about Maliki Fiqh, and I say to Sheikh Hamza, do you have any advice to those of us amongst the community who want to speak truth to power and yeah. want to blah, 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 and we want to, you know, speak, to, you know, to the cause of justice? He looked at me dead in the face. He said, get married. Hmm. And I was like, get married, get married. Yeah. and guess what? I got married. That's <laughs> Chill out a little bit, you know. <laughs> and and for, I mean, I think that there's a lot of angry mm-hmm. young men that it would do them good to get married and then see how much of a revolutionary you are when you have to wake up at two o'clock in the morning to go buy diapers. You got to pay rent and right, keep health insurance for your kids and begin to do a college college fund for your children. And okay, yalla, let's see how much of a <laughs> revolutionary you are. So. I don't know if that story kind of narrates, like kind of highlights it. He's he's our mentor. He's like, he's he's agitating very real things for us. Right. And even on the national scene, I mean, like there's a book coming out in December by Zarina Grewal, who I would love to have on the show. She's a professor at Yale. She actually spoke at this last convocation that Zaytuna had. Her her book is called Islam is a Foreign Country. And in it, she talks about the crisis of authority, uh, you know, in the American Muslim community here. Um, And, you know, I mean, she's dedicated a whole chunk of her book just talking about how people like Imam Zaid Shakir, you know, Sheikh Hamza Yusuf, how they changed the entire, entire national discourse for, for, for the Muslim community. Mm-hmm. Uh, and you really see that as a shift. So, I mean, from my vantage point, attending these large conferences attended by 40, tens of thousands of people, uh, you know, you see that change. You see that change happen very, very uh, drastically. In terms yeah. of the national dialogue, so, so I mean that's a different story. I mean I don't want to bring in that story, but I think that that's a story that needs to be you know, listen yeah. up for future episodes. Yeah, I exactly. Imagine, we'll but, have to um, put a pin in that. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Uh, so, so th- now this is Zaytuna is at the the old uh, off of Jackson. No, this is before that. So oh, okay. this is ninety six. Zaytuna started. Um, Dr. Hisham Al Alusi and Sheikh Hamza co-founded. Um, it's basically running out of Sheikh Hamza's house, and then eventually there was a small office in micro-based technologies ran by a man named Abid Malik, um, and a brother named Mazen Halabi was one of the first Zaytuna um, staff members. Who's my roommate, actually, <laughs> for four months. Who's my roommate <laughs> when I first moved here. Yeah, and Mazen, Mazen was also my roommate, and he could tell you a story or two, but I hope he does. <laughs> but, uh, you know, Mazen, again, these are some of the unsung heroes, man, that, that, that may or may not make it into the books, but some of the real critical people. Mazen's running this little office, working on translations, working on some of the early publications. I end up working in that company as a, the, the sales manager. So the office that the first Zaytuna... The building that the first Zaytuna office was ever in also was a company that I happened to work for. Um, but that's like, this is 99-2000, which mm-hmm. is right around the same time that the property in, in Hayward had been purchased. Right. Okay. So this is kind of the early budding phase of, mm-hmm. of Zaytuna. In between those two things, I go overseas, live in Morocco, get married, live in Egypt... Um, visit Saudi Arabia, which makes your story even more interesting because you marry an, you, you marry a Moroccan woman mm-hmm. in Morocco. Mm-hmm. Uh, so talk about you know we, we've already talked about your own background, but now the, the sort of the next chapter becoming even yeah. more colorful. The, yeah, even the more ne- colorful. That may, that may be right? I mean, podcast. imagine your children now. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> your, your, your your children telling their story. Well, I mean, yeah, I mean, and honestly, man, I think the the to if there was a story I could tell that I think tells that very long story as short as possible it was when my father and my wife's father met for the first time three years ago on Thanksgiving I've heard you say Um, it's beautiful and you know my father-in-law comes from a long line of uh, noble scholars and people who were who were renowned um, kind of scholars and, and very saintly people within the Muslim tradition in the old Imperial city of Fez in Morocco. Okay. Um, they're distant rel- relatives of the current king of Morocco. He was a direct student of uh, Sheikh Ibn Habib, who's one of the great 
um, great scholars, later scholars in Moroccan um, Islamic history. Um, there There's also, a veneration in Muslim tradition and in the Muslim world for people who are descendants of the Prophet Muhammad, but, known as the Sharif. They're, they're also, yeah, so they're also short of which means Shurafa, that they have, exactly. um, like other people that I know, have a, a, you know a family tree that kind of traces their lineage back That's to right, Prophet we're Muhammad. Sitting next to an, a, a Hassan, right? right as well, so, right, so, Shabbat. so, needless to say, here comes this kind of um, <laughs> this kind of aspiring dervish from you know from northern california into the morocco <laughs> study arabic and sheikh hamza again again sends me to her father's house just to kind of stay there for a few days mm-hmm. and i look up six months later and i'm engaged and you know and, and her her father was a long time friend known sheikh hamza so i think he was 18 or something like that um and sheikh hamza um very graciously hooks us up with her father we stay there a friend of mine and myself stay there um studying Arabic and eventually, yeah, to make a long story short, I marry his daughter. Um, so he's like my teacher and my father-in-law, which makes for, you know, a really a very, very, very loaded and very blessed, <laughs> no, really very intense relationship because now, like, your sheikh is your father-in-law. Which, correct um, me if I'm wrong, I mean, it's not too uncommon in Muslim tradition, right, for that to happen? Not right? at all, but it's, I mean, it's part of what... Makes, I mean, not to downplay your story. Not I at just all. I mean, in terms of this is part of a totally. kind of greater narrative. And, and it's a Muslim very world. different take on in-laws. Yeah, 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 yeah that's find right. kind of in, in some other circles, you know, right. where it's like, that's my family. It's not like, it's so, but again, I'm coming from the background you of just heard. I don't even, I don't know who my ancestors yeah. were because some slave master stole their name. That's the reality. So you go from that to someone who's basically Can nobility. Trace their lineage person by li- person. Quite literally, yeah. Centuries. Quite literally, right? yeah. Right. And so... I mean, it sounds absurd as I'm telling stories. Like, it's my life, but it sounds no, completely no, it's, it's asinine. Just so, long story short, yeah. we, we move home. We get married. Um, we live in Egypt. We live in Saudi Arabia. We move home from the kind of early days of when people begin to hear about Zaytun Institute. 2000, fast forward to 2010 or whatever it was, 2011. Our fathers hadn't met yet. Our mothers had met because my mother went to Morocco. Her parents, parents eventually get green cards to come here. Mm. It's the first Thanksgiving when our entire family, our kind of bigger family, is going to be all together, and it's at my house. And my father-in-law is a very beautiful man, uh, and he's a very, he's a very saintly man, but he's also a very traditional man. I mean, he wears a, like a robe and a turban all the time. Like he doesn't go out. That's how he always dresses. My father is a seventy-year-old black man from Oklahoma. Um, he is a traditional man in his own right. sense, but right. it's a very different tradition. Tradition, yeah. Needless to say, they've never met. There, so here's this moment where it's like our father's meeting for the first time. I'm nervous as can be. My father is also handicapped because of a, a near death car accident that he got in some years ago. So he's kind of coming up to the door of my house with his walker, and out comes my father in law, and they embrace. And they're just both smiling and mm. saying, I love you, and my brother, and you're so beautiful. And there's like the translator. And you know, men, I don't know how to process this. I'm like, so I just walk away because I'm like, this is too heavy. <laughs> 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 like, it was too deep. Like they had this really kind of deep fraternal moment. And I was just like, I, I, I walked away. Right. Before I know it, my father in law, after he gets my dad in the house, he literally goes bolting up to his room mm. and he's bawling, like profusely, profusely weeping. Mm. And I'm like, oh my God, what happened? He comes down and he said, I'm really sorry for losing it, but he reminded me of my father. Mm. And so he, and the, you know, the, again, from these completely different yeah, backgrounds. Oceans apart. Yeah. And from that it's moment, they're apart. just like, they're like peas in the pot. I mean, they're just, I mean, obviously they don't go golfing together <laughs> or whatever, but they're, they love one another and it's always my brother. And to just see all of these notions of like intolerance yeah. and classism and racism and exclusion, you know, ex- exclusivist kind of otherization, right. just in a moment be challenged right. culturally, That's religiously. Right. Then it came time for dinner, and we got these two big old halal turkeys on the table. Well, I was going to say, I mean, you, you, worth noting is the context of this quintessentially American celebration of Thanksgiving. <laughs> right. I mean, it, with a bunch of black Native Americans. Right. Right. You know what I mean? Talking about a conundrum, we're right? talking, you know, a holiday not even shared by our neighbors to the north of us. You right. know, this is quintessentially American. Right. So, and this. Is and so here you got, you know, yeah, you got it, bean pie, sweet potato pie, and apple pie, and you know, some Moroccan 
twist on a turkey, or <laughs> these two big old halal turkeys, and Got the it. whole families are yeah. all my siblings, everyone. That's right. That's right. Well, it's, I mean, just from what you're describing, it's it's a reinforcement of one kind of cultural construct, which is the celebration of Thanksgiving, and yeah. then the dismissal of a different kind of cultural construct, which is, you know, what you described, the prejudices and yeah. preconceptions. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So the really deep moment for me was, it came time to say grace. And if you know, like in Christian families, saying yeah. grace, especially the big holiday on Thanksgiving, right. kind of a big thing. Mm-hmm. And in black families, you know, if the patriarch or the matriarch gets to saying grace pretty soon, you're talking about the old the pets and the neighbor's the car. And <laughs> God bless Mrs. Jones, Mrs. Jones. And so, yeah, so it was an awkward moment where, and my father's asked me to bless the food in the past, and I just can't really, you know, Muslim prayers for eating tend to be pretty straightforward. Right. Bismillah. Right. You know, Bismillah. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, and so I've never, and I've also just not really felt it didn't feel right to me Mm -hmm. to kind of, you know, it's kind of the elder usually whatever. And my father feels important about that. So he says, can you please ask your father-in-law to bless the food? And that's a big deal for a Christian man, for my father's trajectory to even ask any other man, let alone a Muslim man, let alone a Muslim man from Morocco, (laughs) let alone basically an an Arab Sheikh, basically (laughs) to bless the food. Yeah. And so my father and I said, well, he's welcome to, you know, whatever he wants. So my father blesses the food and was so deferential in his saying grace that he didn't even say in Jesus' name in at the end of it. Name. Which, again, people at his church, if they're listening to this, may, I mean, I mean, but he was just out of deference. He didn't want to say, you know, what he would typically say in Jesus' name. Amen. And then my father and I read the Fatiha, and that was our Thanksgiving dinner. And that's basically our experience is like... Yeah, man, um, you know, the anti-black sentiments that you find in certain communities, the anti-Muslim sentiments that you find in others, all of that stuff just challenges. It's like, man, people are family. And food has a you know a powerful yeah. kind of magnetic power to bring us all together, you know. But <laughs> the when great we, uniter. Yeah, when we challenge ourselves a little bit, mm-hmm. you know. And so that informs a lot of my work is just that I don't believe, I don't believe the hype, mm-hmm. to use a, you know, statement yeah, yeah, yeah. popular by public right. enemy, don't believe the hype. That's I don't right. believe it. We can... You know, if we were to try to ask answer Rodney King, yes, we can all get along. Yeah. If we would just challenge ourselves right, a little right. bit, you know. So, I mean, I think you you, you mentioned your work. I think this this presents a good segue to talk about. Uh, well, and 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 just just to just to sort of uh, fill in a little bit of a gap here because I think this is an important part of the story. Mm-hmm. Uh, you're overseas, and uh, at, at what point does does nine eleven happen, and mm-hmm. and what what role does that play, if any? Well, I mean, I don't think there's anybody alive in our age that it didn't have a, an immediate um, or, a, you know, a, an indirect impact on. Um, 9-11 happens five days after I become a father. Um, when my wife is laying in bed recuperating from giving birth to our oldest son, Muhammad. Um, and again, it's one of those moments where, you, you know, it's hard to not weep thinking back on... on uh, that morning um, because you know my son interestingly and not a lot of people know this was born five years to the day almost to the hour of my shahada wow wow so I became Muslim became a father on the same same day so September 6th is always kind of it's more important than any other day frankly every year for me my you know again 9-11 happens what ends up becoming I think 7 or 8 a.m. Pacific Standard Time. Correct. Yeah. 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 So it's early in the morning. I get a call from a buddy. He says, I think he said they hit the Pentagon, I think is what he said first. Didn't have a TV. I go online. I just remember that picture of Bush's face as the, and then the image of the plane kind of crashing into the thing. And I'm just like, oh my God, get a call from my dad. And he's obviously concerned for our well being. Long story short, you know, like all a lot of other families, we're like, well, I don't know how safe is it? What do you know? Mm-hmm. Do you go out? Do you not go out? And by the grace of God, I mean, I think um, I think the fact that there was not more violence after 9-11 is a powerful testimony, testimony. to the American people's Absolutely. tolerance. That's I mean, right. if we're fair. Oh, yeah. If we're fair. Right. Um, you know, I thought it was going to be a bloodbath, to be right. honest with you. Right. Um, and yeah, there was a, there's been a lot of errors on a lot of different sides after 9-11, but I think one of the successes was people's ability to... And, and, you know, and condolences to the people who have been lost because of... And again, I'm talking about a local context. I'm not yeah, talking yeah, about yeah. a geopolitical that's critique. That's I mean, right, it's a different right, yeah. ball of wax. That's all a separate conversation. Yeah, but I mean, so 
Yeah, how does it affect, I mean, well, you know, there's the whole George Bush, you're either with us or with them statement. And proving that dichotomy false, Mm -hmm. or not, that's not the right way to say it. Proving that false, not Hmm. a dichotomy. Hmm. Um, Right. And saying, (laughs) actually, Mr. President, we're not with you Mm -hmm. or with them Mm -hmm. in terms of endorsing or supporting indiscriminate violence. Right. Period. This is not that simple. What what I remember uh, about when President Bush made that statement was uh, Sheikh Hamza was in the audience. Yeah. Uh, He he was uh, invited there. And I remember there was uh, a lot of criticism of that Mm -hmm. from within the Muslim community. And I I remember... uh, Feeling like, well, don't don't we want that? Don't we want people representing the, you know? Yeah, I mean, and and again, um, you know, I know Sheikh Hamza not only as a public figure, but also as someone who's been a, an immediate mentor to me and kind of a father figure. And I have never seen, and I've been with him in several countries, and um, dozens of states, and hundreds of situations. I have never seen anything that would cause me to question his commitment to truth Mm. or cause me to question his personal uprightness. Hmm. And I mean behind closed doors in a multitude of situations. Performed Hajj with him twice. um, Have been a student for, you know, 17 years. So when he went, to me, it's like I know he's not shooting entirely from the hip. I mean, inevitably, he's responding like everybody else is responding to a very, very difficult situation. But I know he's talking to his teachers. Yeah. I know he's getting the advice of his elders. And I know that he's seeking uh, divine guidance. And I know that he's doing his best. And he may have made some statements, like a lot of people, who you know one could unpackage and deconstruct. But I'll tell you one thing, he's one of the people who rose to the occasion. That's right. While a lot, a lot of other people sat at the sideline and, and, you know, granted, there wasn't, you know, there wasn't really, social media wasn't as, as big back then. And so you didn't have the, 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 uh, the pundits that you have now and the people pontificating from behind their keyboard like the way you have now. Correct. But had you had that, yeah. there would have just been a lot of people who were doing nothing more than clicktivism. Of course. Clicking this and liking this and reacting to this, reacting to that. Clicktivism. You know, yeah. where um, Michael White coined that, by the way. Wow. That's not me. I believe Michael White coined it, a famous <laughs> journalist. But uh, I don't want to take credit. But <laughs> he has a really interesting article moving you know, beyond clicktivism. Oh. There was a piece in Adbusters. And, oh, okay. Anyways, I don't want to... No, no, no. By all means, that. <laughs> But, uh, yeah, man, I mean, um, so I was also hearing hearing the, the details of him being at, I believe, the Pentagon or the White House when they had named the, the, the operation in Iraq Operation Infinite Justice. Mm-hmm. Infinite Justice, yeah, that's right. And, and Sheikh Hamza says to the rabbi, and I believe another faith leader, I don't remember who, we can't let him say that. Right. And neither of them... We're willing to, and he said, "Mr. President, I'm sorry, but you, you can't call it that. That's right. You know, it's, we believe that to be an attribute of God." And I think President Bush, being the, the brilliant, um, you know, scholar, <laughs> he has said something like, "We don't have theologians down in the Pentagon, or whatever." He said some something like, that. "I mean, I wasn't there, but I heard it kind of yeah, yeah, second hand, right. but." You know, uh, but, but to his credit, I mean, they. they well, so they, Muslims, so there's some Muslims that would say, like, well, it's almost endorsing the the operation, uh, but giving it a better name. Right. The Prophet said the best struggle is to speak truth in the face of a, of a tyrannical right. ruler. Correct. And so, I've never had the opportunity to criticize a president. I, I think that's that how happening many people, inside of the Oval Office. I mean, literally, I think from this, the version I heard of the right? story. Uh, you know what I mean? So and it's so, like, would you really say anything? You want to talk you about court orders yeah. and power. So you know, it's like the speaking truth to power quite yeah. literally. So again, yeah. I mean, I believe wholeheartedly that Sheikh Hamza really did his level best. Correct. And people also didn't see the level of personal sacrifice, the level of family sacrifice, the level of... I mean, I know from traveling and, and, and you know speaking publicly more than I would like to, just your health, you know, the lack of sleep. I mean, uh, Sheikh Hamza, Sheikh Hamza has given his life, man. Mm-hmm. And so, people who want to critique, they're welcome to critique. But yeah. uh, you know, I mean, 
he rose to the occasion. And God, thank God that he was there as a voice of reason when you had other voices from the Muslim community who basically put the community's foot in its mouth <laughs> on behalf of whoever, you know, right. saying this or that. So, I, I mean, I really believe Sheikh Hamza did his level best. Yeah, yeah. And I don't know that I could have I could have done what he did or sure, sure, surely couldn't have done any better. So I don't know if I'm answering your question. Yeah, absolutely, it. yeah. Well, and, and I think to that point, that, that kind of brings us to, you know, you talked about the work you're doing and... Uh, it it seems like the the role that this uh, organization serves right now for the community in in the aftermath of 9-11, 10 years later, uh, is pretty important in, in terms of interfaith outreach and whatnot. And I was wondering if you could get into that a little bit. Uh, what led to Dalif's founding and uh, what does it represent today? What, what do you hope it represents eventually? Well, um, I mean, I think it, it's been kind of... Yeah, I mean, I think the context has been provided to... And, and other times I may not address it this directly, but Tetlif essentially comes out of Zaytun Institute's outreach program. Hmm. Um, so from 2002, basically aftermath of 9-11, until 2005, what is now Tetlif was Zaytun Institute's outreach program operating under the auspices of Zaytuna before the birth of Zaytuna College. Right. And as Zaytun Institute begins to kind of uh, tread the path toward becoming a formal college, some of the programs that were under the auspices of Zaytuna were requested to spin off and to form independent nonprofit initiatives. Tetlif is basically one of those. Um, while we were operating under the auspices of, of Zaytuna, I was the director of that program and saw literally dozens, probably more accurately a couple hundred people embrace Islam through that program who had either heard about Zaytuna through the work of Sheikh Hamza or the, the, the very esteemed scholar Imam Zaid Shakr, who ultimately joins the team there. And so imagine anybody nationally or globally, for that matter, who hears about them and then wants to inquire more about Islam, that comes essentially across my desk mm-hmm. over the course of that. So there was a plethora of people from a, a wide array of, of, of experiences. Um, so yeah, a kind of a community, a micro-community was born within a community almost. Mm-hmm that makes sense um we were focusing on youth and focusing on converts and then also focusing on uh incarcerated muslims right and so we're so, talking circa 2003 2004 exactly right? yeah. yeah and in that period i begin to go into the prisons as a volunteer and then you when tet leaf is born in 2005 by that point i'm a full-time chaplain for the state of the state of california department of corrections working as a muslim chaplain and all of that stuff is born out of the Zaytun Institute um, outreach program, and and basically is, is again um, on the coattails of, of Sheikh Hamza and Imam Zaid. Um, so yeah, in two thousand five, we are now an independent organization that's focusing on speaking to the needs and speaking to the questions of folks that are interested in learning about Islam from other faith communities and faith experiences, and then also assisting those people amongst. You know those interested that end up embracing Islam, which is, as you know, a large number of people. People convert to Islam. Um, you know, some would say 10, 20, 30, maybe fifty thousand people annually in the U.S., more or less. And uh, in, in any way, there's a lot of people. And in any given community, you'll see over the course of a year several dozen people usually embrace Islam. Right. So, um, yeah, I mean, there's just this community born where you've got people everywhere from directors of Fortune 500 companies to people coming out of the prison and everything in between who want to become Muslim. And so that's been that's been my work for the last, you know, last 10 years or so, or 12 years or so. Um, Tetlif, by the time it comes into kind of a formal organizational body, um, attempts to provide space, provide content, provide companionship that can allow for a healthy understanding, embrace, and realization of Islam. And what that means in English is that we want to make the process of learning about Islam, conversion to Islam, or recommitment to Islam right. more sustainable in our context. Right. I mean, that's what it, what it really means. And out of that idea, again, another community is born. So people who know Tetlif from being in the community would know it as a place where you can kind of go and see a really unique mix of people that come from historically Muslim families and historically Muslim countries to people who have converted to Islam to like non-Muslim guests. People really enjoying, I think, a really unique space for fellowship and, and learning and what have you. Um, we have a branch here in Fremont and one now in Chicago as well. Um, if you could speak to, just uh, for those who don't know, like what the word Tatlif means. Like, well, Tatlif basically yeah. means everything we've talked about. It, just, right. it means reconciliation. It means it means bringing hearts together. It means p- 
producing that state that is prevalent in the absence of war. It means Mm -hmm. giving people the ability to manifest goodwill after themselves having been manifested. It means uniting, it means reconciling between that or those two things that appear at first glance to be irreconcilable opposites, uh, which is the state of human psyches and human souls in a lot of times that we look at ourselves and think, man, I could never get along with this cat. That's right. <laughs> but God and his omnipotent, you know, providential power unites people's hearts. And so that's what tetlif means. It just means kind of... But it also, an, another meaning that people don't tend to um, know is that tetlif also means penmanship that's or right. authorship. Someone it means writes a writer. And Muallif right. is a, an author. Yeah. And so the reason I, I so appreciate the word with all his offerings is that like it means bringing people's hearts together but also telling a story. That's right. Um, yeah. And that's, I think, a, it's just a beautiful word. Telling a narrative, yeah. Yeah. People call it ta'lif sometimes, which means feeding goats. <laughs> if you... <laughs> <laughs> you make the guttural A, yeah. Yeah, exactly. the guttural A means feeding goats, which may have its own interpretive conversation. There you go, yeah. yeah. <laughs> that leaf just means, yeah, it means bringing hearts together. Well, and and what what would you like this organization to represent? The future. And what is the as future? As corny as that sounds. Well, I mean, but, but what does that mean? I mean, well, there are some people for whom the future is a dark place, where a lot of bad stuff happens and a lot of people get hurt and there's some people investing in that and for some people the future is a a world where the evil has been mitigated the forces of darkness have been you know have been sidelined and where human beings have been given the opportunity to come to know and come to love one another and you got to be a dreamer to believe in the second one (laughs) Um, but I, I'm a dreamer. Yeah. As my board are dreamers, and my team here are dreamers, and our, you know, it's like we can, we can, can you know, again, trying to answer Rodney King's mm-hmm. kind of, you know, um, proverbial question: Can we all get along? It's like, yeah, inshallah, God willing, we can. Mm-hmm. So that's what I mean by the future. Simply, you know, or kind of on a more like immediate level, it means like where my children and your children. And um, Provez's children and our fa- our community's children, they feel okay about being Muslim as Americans. Where practicing Islam for them is an American option, and I say it that way deliberately hmm. because there are a lot of other American options, and a lot hmm. of uh, Muslim kids right. choose other options. That's right. And where a, a place where like our kids are not living in this socially schizophrenic, dichotomous, confused Doctor Jekyll and Mister Hyde multiple modality type experience where it's just normal man for better or worse yeah. you know however devout they may or may not be but they identify as Muslim and yeah. hopefully take that seriously and I think that it's a challenge it's one thing for me to convert to Islam it's another thing for you to be born Muslim in a devout family for our kids it's going to mean it's going gonna, it's gonna to be our young people today are faced with challenges that are simply unprecedented in human history mm-hmm. It has never been more unique, if not more challenging, to just be a normal young person. Can you expand on that a little bit? Well, I mean, my father remembers when the first television was came to his neighborhood. My daughter knows more about the iPhone than I do, and she's six. Right, yeah. Do the math. That's right. I mean, the technological ad- advances... I mean, I think we harp a lot on social media, mm. but the reality is that those are vehicles that a lot of people are using for good, but maybe as many, if not more people, are using for, you know, maybe less than virtuous things at times. And so, just like living it. And again, when I got out of high school, they had those big old, yeah, you know, yeah, yeah. brick cell phones. Motorola bricks. Yeah, you were really, a, you know, really cool if you had a pager, man. I mean, you were like, <laughs> oh, gee, yeah. if you had a pager, right? <laughs> and so, look again at like just how quickly things. And so, we don't even know what does the future hold in terms of. Yeah. The technological tools for people to do good or to do bad, right? Um, that's what I mean, just like uniquely challenged. I right. To me, it's not necessarily a dark, um, cloudy future, but it's definitely a challenging one. Um, yeah, I think you just, again, what were the things popular in music when I was in high school compared to what are the things popular for kids now mm-hmm. in popular music? Let alone what was popular for my... I mean, Elvis was racy, man, for my... my That's right. <laughs> Ray Charles singing secular music and not singing church music was racy, man. I mean, that's a, a far, far cry from twerking or this or that or you know any other stuff the kids are having to... You know, Miley Cyrus has now become a sex symbol. Yeah, right. 
So, yeah. and that's popular music. And I'm not trying to pick on Miley Cyrus, but I'm just saying, no, really. I mean, I, I'm not that guy. Yeah, yeah, I'm not yeah, the yeah. guy that likes to, you know, harp on right. popular culture because kids are doing what they're dealing with. But I do think that it's a different world than the one we grew up in, for sure. Not to mention, what's the legacy we're leaving them? Mm-hmm. We're leaving them a world where there's so many theaters of war you can't even count them. Hmm. A world where climate change has brought this thing called global warming so imminently upon us that we don't even and people are sort of arguing about whether or not there's a human human component component. Right. You know what I'm saying? So we're leaving them a world. We're leaving them Syria. We're leaving them the south side of Chicago. That's right. We're leaving them. And I know and I'm beginning disparity to, between the rich and the poor. Yeah, I mean, you can go right. Out and and I, I'm beginning to paint that right, first right. future. Yeah. Because guess what, yeah. homie? It doesn't, right now, if you look out there, it looks pretty bleak. Right. So we've got to try to paint that other one. Right. Where, it hasn't been written, luckily. Yeah, you know. And it's scary, man. I mean, I know you guys are both parents. I know it keeps you up at night. Yeah. yeah. And I'm, I'll be honest with you. There's people who, who lose sleep over money, lose sleep over the future of this country and the future of this world and the future of our children. Money and whatever. Money comes and goes, but it's like, what, what world are we leaving behind for our kids? Mm-hmm. So I think at least you got to create a space for them to at least talk about it. You know, I mean, I'm on the board of the the high school called the Verowitz High School, and um, there's times that I create space for conversation with the kids. And I remember this one day we'd shown a video and and uh, asked the kids, "What do you guys think about this video?" And they all expressed themselves and gave you know they gave kind of the right answer. So <laughs> this, this one this one young man, brilliant young kid, I said to him, "I said, what did you think about it?" He goes, "Well, it just made me so proud to be a Muslim and." It's, so thankful for the mosques in our community. I said, is that what you really feel? And he said, mm, no. <laughs> and I said, what, what, what do you really feel? He goes, I, I don't know. <laughs> and he just wanted to move move, you know, move it on. There was a, 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 a conversation with kids on the south side of Chicago that's now officially the murder capital of America as of last weekend. That's right. I just read 300 that. 300 people almost killed this year. 500 yeah. plus last year. 13 people shot in one in one one weekend last weekend mm-hmm. a young man was asked by one of our leaders in that community um, how does this all make you feel and he said Facebook she said how does it make you feel he said Facebook she said what do you mean he said I just looked on Facebook to see what other people were feeling wow huh. so wow. it's like how do I even feel about the fact that kids my age are dropping left and right yeah. You know? So it's it's emotion by proxy. It's you know, emotion. Well, which is interesting because I mean, one of the, you know w- w- one of the things in the news lately has been this whole fiasco over the whole Miss America and right. people taking to the Twitter Twitter sphere and whatever. I don't know. Yeah, yeah. The, <laughs> the, the people tweeting all kinds of uh, well, well, Twitter, bigoted and racist remarks. D- Twitter lets people bypass like the the filter inside your head right. where you're like, should I? Is this appropriate? Twitter just kind of right. jumps over that sometimes, and that, that I was wondering if you could you could talk about that a little bit. I mean, the role of engagement, the role of cultural engagement for this future generation. I mean, I mean, uh, how, how how do they embody their? I don't want to say their Muslimness, but their Islam in a way that's that's you know that that feels safe. For people who think that a Hindu woman in a bathing suit is too Muslim, <laughs> well, I mean, there, there's, you know, that's a big, yeah. that's a big uh, conversation because it, it highlights the fact that, like, many Muslims, I think, are afraid of racializing and afraid of kind of admitting that the majority of our community are brown folk, at least. Um, which means something very real for you know a, a culture that still sees through the lens of white supremacy, mm-hmm. and so you know the 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 if I'm not mistaken, the majority of people who were victims of hate crimes after 9/11 were Sikhs. Right. Mm-hmm. We just in fact just, just today two days ago today. there was a professor in New York who a Sikh professor who was beaten called Osama a terrorist. Yeah. yeah. Do the math. I mean, it says something about the the level, very deep levels of ignorance in pockets of. The you know pockets and it's really, it's really important that we oh, say yeah. that it's pockets right. of right. the greater community, but very very deep levels of ignorance. But it also says something about you know the imperative of people in communities of color to understand themselves and to speak meaningfully about that, especially for their children. You know, I, I was picked up in the taxi from from SFO San Francisco Airport coming home. I live forty five minutes south of the airport, and this kid who picks me up. Um, Obviously, a South Asian kid. I was, but you never know. I don't want to make assumptions. Is he Muslim? Is he Sikh? Is he Hindu? 
by the time we get halfway home, I basically became his kind of his counselor. I'm walking through like stuff with his parents and life and this and that, and you know, and and by the time we get over the bridge and we're in Fremont, you know, ten minutes from my house or so, he says he said a name that I knew he was identifiably Sikh. I just happened to know enough. I have enough Sikh friends and community folks I grew up with to know that that name. So. But then he wanted to change his first name. He's like, yo, I want to change my first name to such and such. So why do you want to do this? I just want to be able to identify as American. And he's trying to negotiate all this stuff that a lot of kids from That's right. communities of color are, are, are trying to... Correct. Especially, you know, people who come from, from Muslim-majority oh, countries yeah. or other Middle Eastern or, or, you know, South Asian countries. So we talked about that a little bit. And then he said, well, my father's a Sikh. And he said, you know, do you know who Sikhs are? And, you know, I said, I said, yeah, a little bit. I'm just trying to let the kid talk. And he says, you know, he goes, they wear the turbans. And I was like, yeah, I know. And he goes, you heard about the shootings. And this was like a couple of weeks after the, the shootings in Wisconsin, I think it was. Mm-hmm. Right, right. Okay, that's right. So, so I was like, yeah, he goes, he goes, you know why they, you know why they did that, right? I was like, well, I said, because they thought we were Muslims. Mm-hmm. And he don't know a Muslim yet. I'm Whitney mm-hmm. Cannon, so he doesn't know. I'm just Mr. Cannon, yeah. guy wearing a suit and tie or whatever. He doesn't know who I am. Yeah, right. that's right. He says... He says, because I thought that he looks in the rearview mirror and goes, never trust a Muslim. Wow. And I was like, well, I think I'm in trouble. I'm in trouble. <laughs> wow. So he goes, he goes, do you know, he's like, do you know what Islam, do you know what Islam teaches? And, and I, I was like, just tell me, right? Yeah. So he, he goes, well, they teach about this thing called jihad. You know what jihad is? I was like, I was like, tell me. And he says, he says that they teach that in order to go to paradise, you have to kill, you have to kill an innocent person. And I'm just kind of letting him talk, mm-hmm. listening to this whole thing. And he, and he just threw the Muslims under the bus, pulled them out and threw them back under. I mean, he just... So I'm, and I'm just, I'm just listening, right? Yeah, yeah. And by the time we get about five minutes from my house, I'm thinking, am I going to text my wife and ask her to come outside? Because she's pretty, you know, identifiably Muslim. Right, right. Uh, identifiably Muslim. So, hmm. um, well, how am I going to do this, right? And this is the same thing I experienced as a black American who appears to be, by white standards, lighter skinned, right. hearing, you know, the N word, left and right. So I, I know right. this. I know the scenario. Right. Let's just say I've navigated these water, yeah, waters yeah, before. Yeah, so yeah, yeah. we pulled up to the house. I said, "I said, I said, bro, can I tell you something?" And he goes, "I said, I look him in the mirror and I said, I'm a Muslim." He goes, he kind of shook. He goes, "What?" I go, "I'm a Muslim." I was like, "Who told you that stuff, man?" Yeah. Hmm. And we just kind of talked about it. And I just well, point by point kind of unpackaged and refuted the fallacy in a lot of what he was saying. Although the point that he said about Muslims Sikhs being attacked because people thought they were Muslims. There may be some validity to that. Correct. I mean, I think that's like the work of Muslim advocates, and yeah. they're they're doing work with communities of color that are allies of the Muslim cause, mm-hmm. and and some of them being from the Sikh community. I think is really important. Yeah. You know, I mean, they honored two Sikh. I forget their names. Two Sikh lawyers who helped with some of the the right. advocacy the Muslim Muslim advocates were involved in. Long story short, we're all in it together, yeah. and you know, yeah, it is it is a problem. But you know, I think that that. That means that even within specific micro communities, in communities of color, there needs to be dialogue. In other words, Muslims and Hindus that come from the same parts of the world need to talk to one another. Mm-hmm. They need to be in communication and they need to identify where there can be collaborative efforts. What are the negotiables and the non negotiables? Um, we need to be communities to speak to one another. Because if we're not, you know, I mean, that's the kind of stuff that's going to happen. That's right. Um, but yeah, I mean, I, I, to be honest with you, I, I'm not up on the the Miss America thing <laughs> <laughs> that much. It's just not. I didn't read up on it enough to really speak meaningfully to it. But uh, no, no. But I, I think you did. And, 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 yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Stupid people said yeah. ignorant comments and demonstrated. I, I think it's that. the nature. Just, someone, um, someone told me something that I think sums it all up. Haters gonna hate and potatoes gonna potato. <laughs> <laughs> Whatever that means. Right. <laughs> Whatever that means. I, know, I was going to say, wow, we can just unpack it. Back. Unpack that for um, yeah. So I, I know we've unpacked a lot uh, and we've covered a lot, but I, I wanted to sort of end on a, on a, on a light sort of maybe, you know note um, because I know you've talked about your work with Tatleaf and I, I think just that represents so much of our conversation just tonight, you know, yeah. just, just on this show. But um, you know, your, your work with your more profit endeavor, which is which is uh, rudimentary, mm-hmm. I'd love for you to speak about that because I think that also uh, is informed, uh, you know, uh, from your own experiences mm-hmm. and, and represents your own travels and and and, and what you bring, you know. Uh, or what makes you you. So I'd love for you to talk about that as well. Yeah, Udimentary as a company, we started in 2004, and it really just came out of a passion that, that myself and the co-owner, Micah Anderson, had for um, 
for oud, which is a type of uh, high-end, very rare, very cherished, prized kind of um, perfume and incense mm-hmm. that grows primarily in um, South Asia and Southeast Asia. It's wood. It, it's a, yeah. yeah, it's wood that comes from a species called the aquilaria tree. It's the dominant species. And it basically is a tree that gets infected <clears throat> and the antibody that the tree produces is what makes the perfume. Right. So it's only infected trees that have brought this antibody that makes the perfume, which makes for a very, very rare product. Um, the the higher quality. Beautiful of which, allegory. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. That's a, yeah. Imam Shafi, yeah. one of the great imams, said you should be like ooh that even as it burns, it just becomes more perfumed. That's right. But in other words, that okay. when people mistreat you, you know that maybe is our answer to the Miss America. Right, 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 right. <laughs> but um, and maybe the meaning of that potato. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Yeah. Yeah. So, so oud is um, um, the higher qualities of it um, are far more expensive than gold, and the, the 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 kind of most expensive kinds can be in the upwards of quarter million, half a million dollars per kilo. Um, right. So, from that down to you know five six bucks a gram, the wood itself that is essentially put on a coal and make for this very kind of um, tenacious incense. Um, is, is a very prized and it's mostly popularized in the Middle East, although the Japanese have a very, very elegant and very celebrated um, and time-tested tradition with aloes wood. Mm. So it just came out of a passion for learning about the incense and about the oil. My, uh, my The co-owner lived in, in Indonesia for the better part of five, five or six years and we both traveled extensively in the region mm-hmm. sourcing the product and we've always we brought it back and um, and so we just recently opened up um, um, an oud bar in 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 in, uh, in Fremont, and um, we also kind of look at the intersectionality between scent and caffeine and, and high end coffee and tea, and trying to again revive that the tradition that like it's about more than just ordering a latte at a drive through, but actually preparing things well, preparing tea well, serving gung fu oolong Chinese style tea, right. and so oudimentary is kind of about an experience for us. It's about Sitting with people, um, smelling beautiful scents, drinking beautiful beverages, and having good company. It's about the people and about the drink and about what we call the burn of kind of. So yeah, we've uh, by the you know by the grace of God enjoyed um, reasonable success, and the company's growing. We just recently launched kind of the two point of our website, but that's one of the passions. One of my passions is is like making good coffee, making good tea, and, and just exploring perfume and like what, what all that means. And it's taken me to some fascinating places in the world and meet, meeting, you know, people in a, in a, a very, very um, expensive but a very, very elegant subculture mm-hmm. that's kind of all throughout um, really the world, but taking me some fascinating places and meeting some real fascinating people, you know. Right. Yeah. And to end with your... Uh I guess your slogan, which is "Don't hate fumigate." Don't hate fumigate. Yeah, Don't hate. Right. It's, a, it's a beautiful ending to the show too. <laughs> so, so yeah. people can can find more information about Talif Correct. Collective at uh, the the URL for the website. Yeah, tetleafcollective dot org or the Facebook page, which is Tetleaf Collective. The Twitter handle is just at Tetleaf T A L E F. Um, and Udimentary is O U D I M E N T A R Y dot com. Excellent. Well, I, I hope people will will definitely check those out. And I know they that they asked me all. It wasn't I, well, that wasn't a shameless plug. <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> uh, we we want to make sure we get the word out. You know, we want exactly. people to seek yeah, it out. Exactly. Uh, you know, for for just uh, as I said up top, just from a personal level, I I was uh, holding out to, to make sure make our show fit with your schedule, and I'm really glad that we did that because uh, I I was absolutely enraptured for the past uh, a little under uh, an hour and a half, and I think I'm very confident our listeners will be as well. Mm-hmm. And I think this makes for a very auspicious start for for what will hopefully be a long run on this show. Well, I'm uh, partly embarrassed, um, partly humbled, but mostly honored by the invitation. Oh, no, it's great. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and uh, uh, Pervez, do you have any... No, I, I think you summed it up really well in terms of uh, what um, having Osama on the show meant and, and, and really starting it off that way. Um, but yeah, I mean... Thank you for your time. And yeah, the time. Uh, well, yeah, thank you, City Usama, for your time. And thank you, everyone out there, for listening. This was our first episode, and uh, we hope you'll join us for the next one and the next one after that. And we hope uh, City Usama will be able to join us again uh, for another episode down the line. Be honored. Hopefully. Thank you for listening. <laughs>